although they came from mission memory purposes, they also opened schools, convents, so our parents do attend at the convents. So during the Second World War, under Japanese, the nuns had to leave, foreign nuns had to leave. We have nuns from, of course, under the British, so we have nuns from Ireland, England, France, and Italy. Uh, so they put our convents. But during the Second World War, they had to leave because Burma was under Japanese. But after Second World War ended, we had independence, so the, the foreign nuns returned, brothers too, they, opened, they still continued to open their school, and that was when we grew up. We went to attend schools, and the nuns insisted, because we went as boarders, so they insisted we have to speak in English, because we were young, we didn't like that. But we are grateful now, because our English is good, thank you. <laughs> but then I managed us to fall under military rule. General Naven, who sees the power in 1962, he said English is not necessary, only Burmese. So the children that grew up during this 50 years military rule, the English is not good. And these are the teachers that are teaching our students now, so you can imagine that the pronunciation is not good. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky. So we have to have English names. I, 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 I have all together, we are a family of eight daughters. You see, our parents bought the children of Sean Chiefs. After getting married, they wanted children. They wanted sons, they planned to have children, sons and daughters. So they started having children, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, for girls. They started hoping and praying, they also <laughs> wanted sons. And they started having, because that was the baby born age. Even in the West, you can afford to have lots of children that was after World War II. So they started having some more children, hoping that they'll get a son. So after eight girls, no sons, <laughs> no hope of getting a son, so we're all together, eight girls, and photographers on the mantelpiece. So that's my family. But now, since you are here, I'll tell the story of the palace you are visiting now. <clears throat> the last ruling prince of Sipor, his wife from Austria, he is my husband Donald's uncle. So, uh, before I tell you how he met his Austrian wife, I'll tell you how he became the ruling chief of Sibor because he is related to the ruling family, but not the dad. I love, I like to, I like history and also I like geography. I like to know which part of the world, which part of Burma travels have come to visit us. You are lucky you can travel the world. We were not lucky. Another military we couldn't travel. And also sanctions imposed on Burma, so very difficult to get visas. And also the people of Burma, very hard, yeah? so they couldn't travel. But so we couldn't travel, we couldn't leave the country, so we were very interested in travels coming from all over the world. Especially here, lots of travels come. So you are lucky you can travel the world. In a way, I'm lucky too. I don't need to travel, but I meet travels from all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> England, Australia, Israel, yeah, so I'm lucky to. So I want you to write your name and your country. So Burma fell under the British in 1888, the whole of Burma. And although because the king in Manle, he was the last, the last kingdom, he fought the British so he lost, so he was taken to exile in India and from India. They had occupied, the British had occupied India already. So from there, they ruled the, the Burmese, where the Burmese lived, directly under them. But the ethnics, they left them as a buffer zone because we were with the border with, uh, we have seven big ethnic groups, border with Thailand, Lao, China, India, and Bangladesh. So they left them ruling each of their own state under them. And Shan state subdivided into 33 states. This system originated from over a thousand years ago. When from the north, the Shans moved on. It was a group of people living in southwest China. But from the north, the Chinese came down. So this group being peace-loving, they came down, and then they separated. One group went to live in Thailand, there they are known as the Thai. In Lao, same group, but they live in, Thailand, in Lao, so they are known as the Lao. And in in China, Southwest China Yunnan, there they are known as the Dai. In India too, we have the small state of Assam, there too we have the Dai. And the group that came to the occupied the Shan Plateau, although the others called the Shan, we call ourselves Thai. 
So you can you can judge from the names. We are the same origin and same language group. We have the same we have lots of words in common. The time and distance have separated us. So like Dashan, we adapt English words, uh, we adapt Burmese words, the Thai adapt Mon Kama words. Uh, in, in China, they adapt Chinese words. In India, the Dai adapt uh, Indian accent. So we have the same origin. So. When we move down this the Shan Plateau, subdivided into 33 states, each with a hereditary chief. Like England, England in the days of old, we have the king, and under them you have the earls, knight, barons, lords taking care of their own counties. So we have 33 states with 33 hereditary chiefs ruling the, the state, each of its state. And Sipor, one of the largest, in 1888, the grandfather of the last prince of Sipor, Photograph is the second one behind you there, the second one, the one in the Jago, the grandfather of the last prince. He was the 85th ruling prince of Sipon under the British. He died 19, the British left them rule, so he was the ruling prince. He died 1902. When he died, he had three sons, so the eldest son succeeded. Later on, he's in ceremonial costume, the British gave him a knighthood. So he's known as Sir Salchek. And while he was ruling, the next photograph is the son, Ben, the only son. He had three daughters, one son, and a big photograph is over there. This was in the Freemasons uh, office. You see, he belonged to Freemason because he went to study in England. This is a big photograph, and he was a patron of the Freemason. <laughs> he joined the group. So he went to England to study well, from young up to when he got his BAMA from Oxford University in history. So he studied, lived a long time in England. So 1920, when he was going back to Sipon, he became very westernized. He lived like an Englishman. At the time, his father was the ruling prince, and that was the palace, the top one there. It's a replica of the palace in Mandalay, on the smaller scale. So the son, the heir, in return, he was very westernized, he adapted English ways. So like most English, English youth, once they come of age, 18 years old, they are adults, they are allowed to leave the, the, the nest. So he too, he wanted to live it independently, not with the father in the palace ground. And also the father, grandfather, like the kings of Burma in the days of old, they were allowed to have many wives. But he being Western educated, he get only one wife. So that was another reason why he didn't want to live in the palace ground. He wanted to live independently with his one wife. So this house we are in now was built for him while he was still the crown prince. He was educated in England, he adapted English ways, and this house was built during the British occupation 1924. So you see? The residence of the Crown Prince, very westernized, built in 1924. That's why in seven years' time, this house will be 100 years old. That's why the people are helping with renovations. If you want to help, you can, you can contribute, because I'm allowed to charge $5 entries. But I don't charge, because it's not a museum, it's a residence. If you want to help, you are welcome. So built during the British time, so very westernized, but it was for the crown prince. So when the father died in 1928, he succeeded the father. But he and his one wife, they continued to live here, make this house their residence, and the palace they used for ceremonial purposes or to receive residence. But then 10 years later, 1938, just before World War II broke up, at the time of World War II, they having found a cure for tuberculosis, TB. A lot of people died of t TB. So when the prince knew he managed to get the, the TB. And although he went to England for treatment, no cure. So when he returned, 1938, he was in his 40s, he passed away. And when he died, he had his wife, no children. So maybe if he had lots of children, maybe one of the wives might have produced an heir. But since he kept only one wife, no heirs, so this direct line stopped. His grandfather was 85, his father 86, he was 87. So when he died, no children to take after him, no heir. So the British took care of the administration of Sipor for a while because 1939-40, Second World War broke out and the British were driven out of Burma by 
the Japanese, so the Japanese occupied Burma during the Second World War. Again, 1945, when World War II ended in Europe, together with the Allies, the British came to take over Burma and to drive the Japanese out of Burma, the Allies, they dropped bombs, so a lot of buildings were hit by the bomb, also in the palace, but the remains of the palace. Only the pillars were left. But the south was not touched by the bomb because during 1945, end of second one, the bombs, maybe you, you will know, they only dropped and destroyed just the surrounding area. Let them draw the bombs drop, not like now. Now, bombs spread. So this house was not touched by the bomb. So the British came back, they rebuilt the country. But 1945, Burma got independence from the British. Just a minute. So the British came back, they rebuilt the country after World War II ended. Then 1948, Burma got independence from the British. So after the after Burma got independence from the British, 1948 January, like Israel, same year, but you got in May. So okay. all the Shan chiefs, the Shan state, and uh, they reinstated the Shan chiefs. That is from father to son. My father was the prince of a neighboring state, 60 miles southeast of Sipo. But Sipo was without a ruler since he died without an heir. So Sipo needed a ruler. So what happened was, you see the last photograph there, his uncle, the one in the dark, sitting with the dark shan suit. That is the, the prince's uncle. His uncle happened to have two sons. So the two sons of his uncle, in relationship to him, they are his cousin. So no son, so the rulership of Sipo went to the cousin. The elder one in the, standing on the left in the dark shan suit happened to be Donald, my husband's father. Or my father-in-law is the older brother. And the younger one, the one in the white shan suit, or Donald's uncle, became the last ruling chief of Sipo, who married Inga from Austria. So you will you'll notice here, the elder brother should be the ruling prince, according to tradition, even in the West. In the royal family, the oldest son should be the chief. But my father-in-law decided not to become, although he should be the ruling prince, because, you see, after independence, like during the British time, all the Shan chiefs, they decided to form the Shan state government in Taonji, capital of Shan state, which the British made into the administrative capital. From there, they ruled the whole of Shan state. So likewise, all the Shan chiefs will form the Shan state government and the chosen head of the Shan state government, a prince from the, uh, from the neighboring state of uh, uh, Mungbit, near the ruby producing mine of Mogo, which Burma is famous for rubies, that prince became the head of the Shan state government. And he and Donald's father, they were very good friends. So when he headed the Shan state government, he called his friend to Taonji to help form the Shan state government. So that's why John Raswada, although he was the older brother, instead of becoming the ruling prince, he let his younger brother rule Sipo. He went to Taonji, joined the Shan state government and became secretary of Shan state government. So as secretary, he looks after all the 53 states in Shan state, whereas the younger brother, only one state, the state of Sipo, state you are visiting now. So you understand now how the younger one, not the elder one, became the ruling prince. So the young prince is my husband, Donald's uncle. So when he became the ruling prince after independence in 1948, as I told you, no more palace. So this house was not touched by the bond, so he lived here. So this one, this became the palace of the last prince. So you see, it's, it looks like an ordinary British house. It doesn't look like a palace, because it was built for the crown prince. So the young prince, after he became the ruling chief, he was very young in his early 20s, and he had already studied geology. And as a geologist, he's made surveys, not only in Sipo, all over Shan State, and he found out there are, not, there are lots of minerals to be discovered in Shan State. So he wanted to bring all the minerals to...